And first up is a gentleman who is an experienced SaaS copywriter and content marketer. He's founder of usermagnet.io, a content marketing agency helping B2B SaaS companies grow their user base and generate quality leads with a targeted content marketing strategy. So welcome, Pavel Grabowski. Hey, hey everyone. Can you hear me? Well, we can indeed hear you. So um, great to have you here, Pavel. Um, cool, so um, cool. pa- I was going to be talking about how to make your content easier to promote. So yep. I'll, just, I'll just pass straight over to you, Pavel. Cool. Listen, David, thanks. Thanks for the introduction. So um, just this is, uh, I suppose this is the moment where we struggle with the, wrangle with the technology a bit. So let me see if I can, if everything works with the screen sharing. Can you see my slides now? Okay. Yes, perfect. Or you can see yes. the title slide. And, Okay, cool. So that works. Okay, there wasn't much wrangling. Good. Okay, guys, how to make your content easier to promote. Now, I'm sure you'll agree uh, promotion actually makes content. Um, you, you can write the best piece, um, you know, offering the best advice, the, the, the most engaging content, create the most engaging content. But unless you actually get it to your target audience, well, it'll most likely flop. You know, it's just not, nothing's going to happen. So um, for that reason, um, a lot of, I suppose, most content marketers would admit to be spending the majority of, of their time working on a piece on actual promotion. And ooh, it's not working. Uh, okay, cool. Um, I'm sure you've heard of the 80-20 rule, and it said that you know we should spend just 20% of the overall time, um, of con- what kind of content marketing time, on creation and um, the remaining time on the promotion. Now, I'm not sure if the division is really 80-20, but yes, promotion typically constitutes the biggest chunk of the, of the process. But have you really wondered what happens in those 80% or in this, this promotion chunk? So um, let's have a look. So typically, when you publish new content, you start by setting up some sort of social media cadence. Um, depends on which schedule you prefer, you might set it up for the next 30 days, 45 days, etc. And then, then you know you can use different different schedules for different social networks, etc. So this uh, next you you typically send uh, kind of email blasts to your list um, saying, hey, we've published new content, etc. And again, you can use RSS uh, based emails you, that they'll generate they'll generate it automatically or send a custom email, etc. Then you submit it to LinkedIn groups, or in our case, LinkedIn groups are a great avenue for promoting content because we work in B two B. But anyway, for or for any, so so you might be submitting it to any equivalent, your equivalent of LinkedIn groups. You probably submit it to industry sites, like again, in our case, it's you know the inbound.org, growthhackers.com, SaaS.community, etc. Uh, maybe you submit it to some directories. Um, then you might be, you know, flicking through Quora uh, questions, see if anybody's asking questions, um, you know, that your content already provides answers for, and you, so you can uh, write a quick answer and and paste the link. Um, you might be using some paid um, strategies as well, so you know, give content a little push on Facebook or Twitter, etc. But the trick is all this doesn't actually make up the entire 80%. If you look at, at, at the way you work, um, you will probably notice that this is actually a small chunk of this 80%. Um, social media cadences, very often marketers have them automated. So um, you know, we use different types of applications, co scheduled buffers, et cetera, to preset them even before the post goes live. Email, uh, emailing the list, again, RSS emails make it make process pretty much automated, and so on. So what happens once we've actually, once we exhaust the typical checklist of things we do to promote content? We spend the rest of the time frantically trying to come up with any other strategy that could work. So here's the catch. You know, the, all the, the, the things we do, typically do, they very quickly plateau. They, you know, they, there's only so much content your social media is going to do, uh, so, so, so much traffic, excuse me your social media is going to deliver unless your audience is growing really, really fast. The same goes for your list. And especially if it's automated, then you really don't have much control over the click-through rates and open rates and so on. So um, yes, you can bump this traffic a little. Um, As I said, spend more money on promotion, submit it to more LinkedIn groups. But sooner or later, 
you're just gonna hit hit the ceiling. So then, because we need more traffic, we constantly need more traffic. We spend, we go online, look for new ways to, um, you know, to promote the content. Look for and look, see if anybody shared some great idea that could help us very quickly attract traffic. But when you look at this whole thing, you quickly realize one thing. Nowhere in the entire process we actually ensure that our content is going to be easy to promote. So generally, we work by a very simple formula. We create and finish the content, and then we start promoting it. So we end up with a finished product, a beautiful, engaging piece of content, and providing great value to the audience. And then we look at it and go, OK, you know, beautiful piece of content. How am I going to promote you now? What am I going to do? Okay, and that's what the big chunk of the 80% of the time goes for. So what, in what you should be doing instead, what, for instance, we've been um, using at User Magnet, I've, and I'm sure many other marketers do it too, so by all means, I'm not saying this is my original idea. However, it works, is actually start with the promotion. So what, what, really, what you should really be doing is planning the promotion first, figuring it out, what other things, apart from your standard checklist, those, you know, the, the setting up social media cadences, emailing the list, etc. What other things you could do to promote the content? Then create the content with those things, or at least one or two of them built in the content, and then you launch the promotion to, where you, and to a content that's already optimized for being promoted this way. So the proper formula for content promotion should be start with the promotion, then create content that includes whatever additional idea for promotion you've, you want to use, and then launch the promotion. But by then, your content is already optimized for it. Thank you, Master Yoda. So what I'm going to talk to you today are four strategies that'll make your, to make your content easier to promote. And the strategies I'm going to talk about are selecting and including the right influencers, and with the emphasis on the three last words, the right influencers. Okay, Referencing tools, featuring other companies as examples, and finally, creating custom visuals for the data. So let's dig in. Selecting and including the right influencers. Look, we've all heard about influencer marketing. It's the big buzzword today, right? And there's some great stats that you know, confirm it's working. 81% of marketers consider it effective. It's the fastest growing acquisition channel. 51% um, of marketers believe they get better customers from influencer marketing, and that's because the relationship began with trust in the influencer. And this is crucial for content marketing. It basically confirms that uh, an influencer, someone your audience holds in high regard sharing, sharing your content, when, when they share your content, they basically assign some of that, their authority and the trust the audience has in them to that content. So in other words, the audience is more likely to click uh, to click or view that content, okay? But here's the catch when it comes to influencer marketing. 75% of marketers struggle to identify the right influencers. And this pretty much, uh, ma this manifests itself very strongly in content marketing. First of all, we target random people. Um, in like, as I mentioned, once we exhaust the list of things we'd normally do to promote content, we start frantically looking for new ways to to give our blog post or infographic a little push. So we start emailing people who maybe have shared something similar in the past, or maybe they didn't. Maybe they mentioned something online, or you know, or we just literally target random people using different search engines to, to find anybody who potentially might be more likely not, but maybe, maybe, maybe be interested in sharing this content. Okay. Or we pick two big influencers. Now everyone would love. I don't know, Neil Patel or um, whoever else is on the top uh, to share their content. But chances of you making there are pretty slim. Yet we try and waste time on this. Okay? We reach, reach out to people who would never share our content. Again, we pick them at random because they share certain characteristics. Maybe they've shared someone else's uh, content on a similar topic, etc. These people have never heard of you before. Chances are that if you tweet or email them, hey, can you share this content? They're just going to hit delete. And lastly, we email people who have no interest in our content. Again, okay. So 
What I'm going to show you today is how to promote content with influencer outreach by first selecting the right people and then doing something for them. So um, just literally to ensure they're going to share your content. So again, the standard formula for influencer outreach is to find an influencer and then send them an email or a tweet. What I'm going to show you is how to select the right person do something for them. And by do something for them, I mean include them strategically in the content. I should have mentioned this earlier. Include them strategically in content and then outreach to them. OK, so, so that's the let's look at each step of the process. Selecting the right person. Um, a common mistake I see with influencer outreach is basically picking up anyone who remotely, who's remotely something in common with your audience. OK? That's and, and, and I, I see it every day in my inbox. You know, um, five years ago I posted something in an e-commerce niche, and now I get like you know e-commerce uh, infographics. But if these people looked into my profile and um, researched me a little, they would know I have nothing to do with e-commerce audience. So even if I shared their content, it wouldn't reach their audience. It would just drum up the numbers of of shares. But that's all. So. The first thing, the right person is someone who communicates with the exact same audience as you. Okay. Second of all, it has to be someone you can access ideally by email. Now, I have nothing against social media outreach. However, I personally I didn't have much success with it. I believe in good old email, in sending uh, an influencer uh, a personalized email. And again, I'll show you in a second what, what information we include there to, 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 to make it work. OK, so ideally, you must have some sort of access to them directly. So again, you're not, even if it's email, it's not their company email. It's a personal email. OK, and apps like Email Hunter make it very easy to find someone's email address. However, if you can't, then at least at User Magnet internally, we don't include that in uh, influencer. They just get off the list because we can't reach them. OK, and the last thing, they should have a strong opinion that you can include and reference. And this is, again, important. Uh, Yes, you can mention someone by name, you can link to their piece, etc. But I believe it's not a strong enough reference to make them um, share your content, to get them to share your content. However, if you if they have a strong opinion on something and you include it, they'll be very likely to um, you know to help you share the content. So what do I mean by doing something for them? I mean, again, I, I've already mentioned I'm it's it's all about strategically including influencers in content, and that means quoting them directly. If you don't have a quote, it could be a reference, but ideally include a quote. Reference their site, not only the blog post you lifted a quote from, but literally tell the audience uh, who they are. And again, as the third point mentions, introduce them to your audience. So instead of saying, Pavel said this, um, or, you know, or Pavel from User Magnet said this, Pavel from User Magnet, a content agent, a content marketing agency said this. You know, it's a very powerful reference, um, and you know, uh, and, and and it just basically helps you position that quote very strongly for them. So finally, you outreach those people. Again, this is what we do. We mention the reference. We send, of course, the link to the content. We describe why we picked the reference. So it's not just, hey, I quoted you in my piece. Here's the link. Please share the content. Doesn't really work. But if you mention, mention the reference, okay, I quoted you in my latest piece, or ideally, I quoted you on this or that in my latest piece. Here's the link. And here's why I did it. Because, and, and you can say things like, because your, you know, um, your quote helped me to uh, highlight the point I was trying to make. And I, you know, I knew my audience wouldn't listen to me, but I know they would listen to you, et cetera. Um, and finally, outline what you did for them in the content, which means mention that you, you quoted them, you reference and link to the site, and introduce them to uh, your audience. So if anybody wanted to find out more about them, the, you know, you've provided the, kind of the avenue to do that. So that's the first method of actually preparing the content for easy promotion. Okay. Second one, referencing tools. And guys, the number one thing every online tool needs is visibility. Simply, every tool wants the audience to notice them or, or get introduced to new audiences. Uh, they also want investors to spot them. Um, and finally, 
they want social proof. They want to, you know, they want to place those logos as featured in logos on their homepage, for instance. And you can use any startup's need for visibility to drive more traffic to your content. So again, you can mention their tool in context. When you're offering advice, you can mention here's the tool that, that you could use to you know, achieve certain effect. And we could, we, we've seen that in presentations um, you know, so far. Like, you know, many of my colleagues mentioned tools. And, and that's a great way to embed a tool very naturally, but you can then outreach and ask the tool for help with promoting your content. Okay? Again, highlight it as a solution for a, to a specific problem, for solving a specific problem. And lastly, you don't even have to mention the tool, actually, or link to them. Include screenshots of their interface or the results they generate, the uh, reports, whatever, whatever suits in the content. That's a very great mention and, and, and of a tool without actually having to push their name. Okay? And again, the best tools to target in these situations are smaller and growing because they need visibility. Asking, uh, you know, in, in featuring fresh books, as much as I love them, I know if I did, um, they probably wouldn't uh, respond to my email, even respond to my email asking them for shares. However, smaller and growing tools, they need visibility. They need it badly. So they're very likely to help you out promoting the piece because they're actually promoting themselves. And um, again, your founders have to be accessible over email. Now, it's either founders or whoever is the person who would make the call to um, push your content on social media. Now, I know, um, again, some people use uh, Twitter for outreach. And maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. Personally, I prefer to send a, an email to the person, explain why they use the tool, uh, maybe say something nice about the tool, and ask them for help with sharing. And that always works. Okay. And of course, they need to target or provide solutions for a similar audience as yours, obviously. Now, one last thing, try out the tool before referencing it to be able to place it in context. It's kind of obvious, but it's worth mentioning anyway. Uh, featuring other companies as examples. Now, businesses love visibility too, visibility too, but they also like links. They like brand mentions. And they like acknowledgement. They like someone on, online to mention, hey, these guys are doing great thing. And you can use that, um, again, to promote content. So when writing, especially practical content, um, guides, or, or if you're trying to teach an audience to solve a specific problem and you're offering, again, a specific solution, include examples of companies that did what you described. And again, these companies must be relevant to your industry or niche. If you're writing for yeah, the IT industry, don't, you know, using examples of food companies or e-commerce stores might not necessarily cut it. Okay? Again, these companies must be accessible over email, and ideally their founders or whoever is responsible for um, their social media uh, management. And they have to correct, correctly util utilize the strategy or advice you're describing in the content, which means it's not like their example sort of falls into the, you know, what you're saying. It has to be the exact solution, okay? So Because the audience are very quickly can spot that, you know, that there's something wrong with that example, okay? And finally, creating custom visuals for the data. Now, guys, I'm sure you know the web's gone visual. There's plenty of stats that prove it. You know, I've just pulled out a few, but... Yeah, you know, there's 46% of marketers say photography is critical to their current marketing. 34% of them uh, select visual assets as their more important content, and content relevant images gets 94% more views, etc. And here's the catch: if you want more people to share and promote your content, create custom images, particularly to support any data your data you reference. So, in other words, um, a lot of the time we install um, image sharing. Uh, buttons, tools, and then we feature um, you know, stock photography or someone else's um, visuals. Now, there is a chance audiences will share it, but there's a greater chance if, you know, to, for, that to have, for that happening if you create a custom image for your data. So instead, simply pulling out someone else's graphs, charts, and putting them to your post, do this. Now, just a quick disclaimer, the 75% of markets, that's a completely made up uh, example uh, stats. That's not validated data. But anyway, find a piece of, uh, um, find a statistic you want to use or, or 
you know, pick one. You, there are plenty of small design tools like Snap, Canva, et cetera, that allow you to create uh, nice graphics and turn that data in a custom, into a custom visual. And again, good reasons for doing so. Visual content is more than 40 times likely to get shared. 71% of online marketers use visual assets in their social media marketing, et cetera. I'm sure you've seen all these stats before. But here's the cut. The catch, the benefits of creating custom images are shares. Yes, people will share your graphs. They, you know, then again, as, as the stats uh, have proved, and I'm, you know, I've seen this behavior over and over, they're more likely to share it because it's engaging. It's something you've created. Now, links, professionals always reference image sources. We do it all the time. If we use someone's image, we reference the source. So if you create your own custom, visual for the data, you know, the, whoever is using it will reference you as an image source. They might reference the original source of the data, but they'll reference you as the image source. So you, you end up with more links. And finally, you, know, you end up with more visually appealing content. It's content that's branded, that's yours. Okay. So that's it. A quick recap. We spent 80% of time on promotion, but nowhere in the process we ensure that our content is easy to promote. To promote content, we should start by planning the promotion first, then creating content, and finally launching the promotion com promotional campaign. And the best ways to embed promotion into your content are referencing the right influencers, mentioning tools and co or companies as examples, and creating custom visuals for the data. All right. Guys, that's it from me. So if you have any questions. Oh, thank you so much, Pavel. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, so um, I mean, I've certainly taken um, lots of notes on that. If anyone's got any um, questions, you know, feel free to share them in the chat there. Um, I'm particularly interested in your 80-20 um, stat there, Pavel. Is, is that something that you think is relevant for every industry out there, that, that most industries need to be focusing a whole lot more time on promotion than they do in producing the content? Well, the catch is that the 80-20 stats, I, it's, you know, it's a stat that, that does its rounds around the internet. It's not something I came up with. Um, however, yes, I do think that in, you know, in th these times, we need to spend more time on promotion. However, what I've been, uh, what I just described, the four methods, they actually cut the promotion time by, well, a lot. So, in, you know, it, you, you basically, you include just one, two elements into your standard checklist, promotional checklist, but because a lot of the preparation work happens when, before and when you create the piece, it actually cuts the time to, you know, to promote. So my point is, yes, we do spend the 80 or whatever, 70% time of promotion, but we don't utilize this time well. So, And there's also a question from Raluca in the chat saying, when is it okay to ask the influencer to share your content? So I guess they're saying, do you just try and actually have that one initial conversation with them before asking them to share your stuff? Or do you need to build up a better relationship with them first? Um, no, actually, the way we do it and the way I describe it, I'm, I'm just going to pull back the slide to, to go back to that slide. Um, blah, 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 blah. I'm sorry. This is, is that by, uh, by for referencing, by picking the right people and including them strategically, you don't have to build that relationship first. Because you're, you're actually the one who's doing something for them, not the other way around. You know, you're... Um, so you, it's, it's almost like the, the, the law of reciprocity. You're doing something. You're providing, you're helping them, you're, you're promoting them pretty much, uh, these, you're promoting these people, and then you just ask for something very small in return. Just if you have the time, could you share, help us uh, promote it, share it, etc. But there's not like, so the, the common uh, influence, outreach email I receive is, hey, we've done this fantastic piece. We love it. This is the best thing we've ever, we've ever done. Um, you know, and our audiences are good. Just go crazy about it. Please share it. I'm like, right. Um, and literally what's in it for me? Like, mm -hmm. you know, as much as I love your content, I don't even know who you are. So in this case, yes, you probably need some um, relationship with an influencer to pull something like that off. However, if you go as a Hey David, listen. Um, I quoted you on this and that in my latest post. Um, here, here's the link if you want to have a look. And listen, I absolutely agree with what you said. Um, you know this, etc., etc., etc. 
and you know your quote helped me to kind of reaffirm my point or or you know again i said uh, just something like that and then you say and listen if it's okay if you could just you know help us a little uh, with promoting it if you could share it to your audience but literally no pressure then i think it's okay i think you can do it like almost like you know send send a, it's a cold email so yes you could send a cold email like that but you're basically saying hey i actually promoted you I, and i included your website and i uh, introduced you to our audience to our audience and it's just you know if you if you have the time if you could help us share it then uh, i would really appreciate it so Great, and I, I loved your advice actually about promoting smaller and growing tools as well, yes. because they're much more likely to latch on to a tweet or just any mention that they have had about their brand. They're exactly. more likely to as well. And plus, you get to develop relationship with them. You know, the the amount like um, you know, I've I've met so many great people this way, um, great founders. Now I work in the software industry, so this is really important for me. Um, you know, where I would reference smaller tool, I would email the person and, you know, we're still emailing each other. We're still and and just because they're a smaller tool now, it doesn't mean they're not going to be a big that, tool in the future. Thing, but also these people are more open. You know, when you try to uh, contact the CEO of, again, FreshBooks, they're probably not going not gonna to go past the gatekeeper, right? Um, yeah. But if you're talking to smaller, you're talking to a founder, you're talking to somebody who's, you know, put their heart and soul into this software and he's really interested he really wants to make it it's you know it's it's very often his livelihood depends on 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 succeeding with this so um so they're very passionate and they you know it's, it's, it's just a great way to also build relationships with, with them well so, thanks so much for the great presentation pavel you, you can find pavel over at usermagnet.io